All right, so if you're thinking, thanks for the laugh, J.D., but what in the world does that have to do with the book of Revelation? I'd say everything starting today in the passage of Scripture we're about to move into. That's because we've reached the part of Revelation where things start getting a bit wild. Or at least we've, re- we've reached the part where certain interpretations start getting wild. Up until this point, everyone largely agrees with what we've been through in Revelation, but it's here that things start to diverge, and things start getting a little speculative and a little bit wild. And if we aren't careful, that is, if we follow any one system a bit blindly like a GPS, we might be headed for some trouble. Now, The Office illustrates that in a pretty humorous way, but there are other examples of this that aren't so humorous. In fact, there's an entire episode of the podcast, Cautionary Tales, that talks about something known as death by GPS, where people literally follow their GPSs blindly off of cliffs and way out into deserts where they run out of gas and out of water. I don't mean to bring the mood of the room down, but... I do want to like properly set the stage for what we're going to read today in Revelation chapter 6 and chapter 7. Uh, you can find that, at least the start of it, on page 1873 in the Bibles under your seats. Now, as you can see, we are going to read two chapters again today. It's a lot of verses, but let me explain why we're going to read such a large passage of Scripture today. We're about to head into a section where we're going to see the seven seals uh, opened which actually unfold over the course of three chapters in the book of Revelation and actually which end in a somewhat anticlimactic way. What I mean is when the seventh seal is open, nothing really seems to happen. There's silence, and then there are seven trumpets that are unveiled, which also unfold over the course of three chapters in Revelation and which also end in a somewhat anticlimactic way. That's because the seventh trumpet leads to the seventh bowl of wrath. Now, if you've been with us for any part of this series, you know something about the number seven. What does the number seven represent? Fullness or completion, right? This is a common trend in apocalyptic literature, which the book of Revelation is. Well, I want to let you know this uh, because um, there's something else that you should know about apocalyptic literature, and that is the fact that time isn't always linear. Like, sometimes the timeline gets a bit cyclical. What I mean is we sometimes see things again and again, kind of on a loop. We see the same scene from multiple vantage points, and that's what's about to happen in these chapters. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls each provides a full picture of the situation in the world and of the sovereignty of God. But these scenes get repeated on a loop three times. So we're going to see the same scene unfold from different vantage points over the course of the next 11 chapters, actually, which means we're going to have to be careful, A, to notice when we're being rerouted, and B, not to follow any one interpretation blindly off a hermeneutical cliff or into a hermeneutical lake. That's today's word of warning. Now to today's passage. We're reading Revelation 6 and 7 together because this is our first full look at our situation. Now, one quick thing before we read this passage. This passage is going to introduce some new numbers that have symbolism with them and some additional imagery, which is difficult to understand. So we're going to have to carefully work our way through this. But one thing at a time. Let's start by reading today's passage, Revelation 6 and 7. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals... Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the lamb lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to uh, to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages. And do not damage the oil and the wine. 
When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beast of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony that they they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you would judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair, and the whole, and the whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and and, and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them from his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. That's a lot. And I think at first glance, it might seem to be a bit overwhelming and depressing. But the thing I want to assure you about in this chapter, and really in the book of Revelation as a whole, and really in history as a whole, that nothing happens outside of the will of God. The point of this is to recognize that God is sovereign over all things, that he holds all things together, and he promises to renew all things when Jesus returns to deliver on the promises that he secured by way of his death and resurrection. 
Now, if you've been with us for this series, in addition to hearing about the number seven, I hope you've heard me say that this book was not written to help us speculate about how the world is going to end. Revelation was actually written to help first century Christians who were suffering tremendously hold on until the end. Well, it's actually true with these chapters as well. Revelation 6 and 7 were written to encourage the early church. It's just that chapter 6 begins with a bit of a hard dose of reality. What happens is God says, I'm going to give you a glimpse of what's going to happen between the resurrection of Jesus and the return of Jesus. God shows us what's happening in the world between Christ's coming and his coming again. Now, so you know, this is not the only place that we see glimpses of this. In fact, Jesus himself shares examples in what's known as his Olivet Discourse. Uh, It's taught in Matthew 24, as well as parallels in Mark and Luke. Jesus there walks us through a very similar timeline. Well, Revelation 6 is actually parallel to this passage, but it's connected specifically to some passages, to a passage that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. That would be Revelation 4 and 5. Now, if you missed that sermon, don't worry about it. You can find it on our website along with every other sermon from this series. The thing that I simply will point your attention to now is in Revelation 4 and 5 where we see God seated on his thrones. We see four living creatures surrounding his thrones. Well, it's those four living creatures who unleash the calamity in Revelation 6. And they do so at the command of Christ. Now, here's where it's important for us to to kind of pause and to recognize something really important. It's the fact that this scene that we're seeing is filled with all sorts of symbolism and all sorts of imagery, which should absolutely be taken seriously, but not necessarily literally. But again, what God wants us to see clearly is that he is sovereign over all things. And that includes evil. Nothing in Revelation 6 or 7 or 8 or 9 or the rest of the book or the rest of history happens without God's permission. That obviously raises a huge question, like, does God somehow cause bad things to happen or does he simply allow bad things to happen? Well, I don't actually know. Scripture doesn't really tell us those things. I tend to think it's the former because of the goodness and love of God that we see revealed throughout Scripture. But it could also be the latter because of the power and wisdom of God. At the end, we're going to have to live with some mystery. And we're going to have to do so recognizing that Revelation 6 wasn't written to assign blame or to spark theological debates. It was written to inspire hope. These words were written to help first century Christians who were facing significant persecution hold on to their faith. Let's consider for a brief moment why first century Christians might need some encouragement, some help holding on to their faith. By the time that Revelation was written in the mid-90s, that would be like 0090, not 1990, not only had every major Christian leader except John been martyred, there had been some massively seismic things that had happened in the world. Starting with an earthquake in 60 AD that destroyed Laodicea as well as some of the other cities that John wrote this letter to. Persecution erupted uh, in 64 AD when the Roman Emperor Nero falsely blamed a devastating fire in the city of Rome on the early church. Chaos erupted in 68 AD when Nero, who was a bit of a madman, killed himself and left a massive power of control. And that is not the way of Jesus. In fact, that's the, 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 the oldest sin that we're aware of. It's what caused Satan to fall. It's the oldest temptation in the Bible. It's what we see Satan trying to use in Genesis chapter 3. It's the temptation, the sin, the evil behind so many things in our world like narcissistic leadership, crusades, state-run religion, Christian nationalism, and every other form of power-grabbing in the world and in the church. Next is the second seal, 
where we find a, a red horse uh, that represents war, anger, and rage. These things that are, unfortunately, all too common in the world. Now, I say that even though at the time that Revelation was written, Rome was in a relative season of peace. But, of course, that peace was achieved because Rome had destroyed its enemies. Again, I'll just point you back to Jerusalem that was destroyed. Where the historian Josephus says that somewhere leading up to that, as many as a million Jews were slaughtered by Rome. War is unfortunately a, a common reality in our world. I mean, if we were to even back up further than the first century, just think about how many wars have happened in the course of human history. Or, or just think about how many wars are happening in our world right now. And of course, those are just the actual literal wars. I mean, there are other forms uh, of conflict, right? I mean, there are culture wars and worship wars. Remember those? And celebrity feuds and family feuds and road rage and rage rooms. Do you know that people literally pay money to go to places where they can smash things just so they can deal with all the anger and stuff that we're all carrying around all the time? And by the way, there are worse ways to deal with your anger. There are also better ways. Particularly when you notice what's causing the anger, that it is often a woundedness and a hurt, a sadness that's underneath. That's why I think the best way to deal with your anger is to let God transform it. Because if you don't, you'll end up transferring it. Which, of course, is what we see in this second rider. Seal number three is next, where we find a, a black horse that is unleashed uh, that represents famine and scarcity and inflation. Now, there is a famine specifically at the heart of this seal, and it may be the one that I talked about earlier, the grain famine from 92 AD. It may also be one that's talked about in Acts chapter 11. Whatever the case, massive crop failure led to rampant inflation. Like, the basic necessity of life became unbearably expensive. But what's interesting, at least when it comes to that grain famine in 92, or maybe I should say what's disturbing, is that there was plenty of oil and wine. Like, the wealthy actually made sure of that. Any new land that was taken by Rome, they didn't plant wheat, they planted grapes. Not to be eaten, but to be drank. Like the rich literally drank themselves to death while the poor starved to death. But literal famines still happen. They're still common in our day. And so is the spiritual famines tend to unearth. You know, human beings don't do so well when resources get scarce. Have you noticed this? I mean, yes, there are certainly examples of people who bless and who share the way God calls us to, but there's often a lot of hoarding and exploiting and price gouging that happens in seasons of need. Brings us to the fourth seal, where we find a pale horse, which represents death, followed by Hades, which is also the realm of the dead, the, the, the grave, as it's sometimes translated in Scripture. Now, these twin riders are granted permission to kill by the sword, that would be war, famine, both literal and spiritual, plague and disease, and by wild beasts, which I think is a way of saying by natural causes in the world. This pair is allowed to affect a quarter of the earth and to kill indiscriminately. Now, this is actually a fitting picture of the first century Roman Empire. Again, it, there was a relative season of peace, at least for those who were in power. But first century Rome was a pretty rough place. I mean, the infant mortality rate was incredibly high. Life expectancy was incredibly low. Some would say, like, in your 20s. Disease and famine and conflict were everyday realities. Rome literally celebrated violence in the Colosseum, as gladiators fought to the death and sometimes as Christians were fed to the lions in the Colosseum. A lot has changed since the first century. Thanks be to God. But some things haven't. People still die of disease, treatable diseases, every day. And there are still diseases that we haven't cured that people die of every day. And war seems to be breaking out every day. At least that's the way I feel when I watch the news. And of course, human beings still don't do well when resources get scarce. 
I don't mean to bring the mood of the room down even further, but that's the picture that we're left with at the end of the four seals. Then something happens. We're transported to heaven, back to God's throne room, which sounds really great until you realize that when we get to God's throne room, what we see is the souls of those who have been slain, slaughtered, martyred for their faith in Jesus under the throne of God, under the altar of God, crying out, How long, sovereign Lord? How long before you avenge our blood and bring justice to the world? Now, that's a really sobering statement. But what they're saying is, how long, God, before you make things right? Like, when will you bring justice to this world which is unjust? Verse 11 says that those who are slain are given white robes. White robes are a common imagery of purity and life in Revelation. And they're told to wait a little longer. Which, again, sounds nice until you hear the rest of it. They're told to wait until the full number of their brothers and sisters had likewise been killed for their faith. In other words, what God says is be patient. The world will continue to be unjust a little longer. And there will be more suffering for the church. That's when seal number six is opened, which reveals some sort of cataclysmic event that will happen at the, at the, before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, I say some kind of event because the earthquake is talked about, but there's really a lot of stock apocalyptic language that's used here. We're not really sure exactly what this event will be under God's justice. Revelation 7 answers that question. Of course, it does so with a little bit of a pause. So, you know, there is a pause between the sixth seal and the seventh seal in the same way that we'll actually see a pause between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. But we have a pause here, and, and I think there's a pause because I think God is saying, hey, you have just digested a whole lot of heavy material. Let's pause and catch your breath. Uh, let's pause and let me reassure you that all hope isn't lost. You've just witnessed some heavy things. Like things are bad on earth, and they're going to get worse, and then God is going to return and judge the world? Yes. But here's the good news in the midst of it. Of course, to see the news, we need to remember something really important about apocalyptic literature, which I told you at the beginning, and that is the fact that time isn't always linear. Remember that part when I told you that, right? It's sometimes circular. We sometimes see things on a loop. We're going to see this scene again. But what happens here in Revelation 7 is this doesn't come chronologically after Revelation 6. Like, this isn't a linear timeline. In fact, what Revelation 7 shows us is a glimpse throughout time. It pauses to show us what God has been doing since the very beginning. Namely, in sealing people to himself. Saving people for himself in the midst of a world that is full of calamity. And the message is that God may not save us from tribulation, but he will absolutely save us through tribulation. Because God is good, because he is gracious and merciful, he will sustain us. And yes, he, in his sovereignty, may grant permission for bad things to happen around us, and sometimes to us, because he seals us with his spirit. Nothing can really harm us. Like God will keep his people safe to the end. And that means even if we die somewhere along the way, that isn't the end because God promises to raise us to life in the end. Now, by the way, I'm using the word us very deliberately here, and I'm using that word deliberately because the 144,000 that we're about to discuss, I think is a picture of us. Now, not just us. I actually think this is a picture of God's people throughout time. Every follower of Jesus, the church with a capital C, which just so happens to include us. Now, I do want to let you know that that's my view on this, but you should also know there are lots of other views. In fact, there might be 144 different th the 44,000 theories on who these people are. We don't have time to discuss all the theories. Maybe if I have to fill in for someone again, I'll teach that in a, in a class. We're not going to deal with it today. What I simply want to do now is tell you why I think this is a picture of us. 
Well, I think this is a picture of the people in the first century who needed some sense of assurance. It starts with the fact that numbers are symbolic. Again, that includes the number seven that we have talked about a lot already. But it also includes other numbers like 24, which we saw back in Revelation 4 and 5, as there were 24 elders surrounding the throne of God. Virtually everyone agrees that those 24 elders represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of Jesus. In other words, God's Old Testament people and his New Testament people. Well, get this. 12 tribes times 12 apostles equals 144. And when you multiply that times 1,000, that would be 10 times 10 times 10, keeping in mind that the number 10 symbolizes perfection, or we might say holy, you get 144,000. In other words, a perfect picture of God's Old Testament and New Testament people being made holy by a God who is 10 times 10 times 10. That is holy, holy, holy. Take note of the fact that in verse 4, John hears this number. He doesn't actually see it. He hears this number, which I think further hints at some symbolism. And it's when he turns in verse 9 and he actually sees what's going on, He sees more people than he can count, more than 144,000. He sees a great multitude, like there is no end to the amount of these people. I think the symbolism here is precise, and what we're learning is that everyone is accounted for. Like no one is lost, no one slips through the cracks of God's sovereignty. But it's also incredibly diverse. What I mean is, This is a group that is made up of, yes, the 12 tribes of Israel, but also people from every tribe and nation and tongue on earth throughout time. This is every follower of Jesus throughout time. This is who will be left standing in the end. Now, make no mistake. God will unleash his wrath against all sin and all injustice in the end. God will make all things right in the end. But God's wrath isn't directed at those who cling to him in hope. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is good news. But the obvious question is, well, what about those who don't cling to Jesus? You know, what about those who run from him or, or resist him or rebel against him? Well, I mean, I can't speak for that. The pictures that we're going to see does seem to suggest that those who ignore God and turn their back will be swept up and away with sin and injustice in the end. That's a really sobering picture. It's a picture we should wrestle with. It's a picture that should move us to share our faith because here is the answer. But the picture that I think God wants us to see is there is good news. There is grace to be found. There is hope to hold on in the person of Jesus. That's what we see in the seven seals. That no harm, no real harm will befall those who cling to Christ, even if we die, even if we are persecuted, even if injustice finds us. No real harm will come to those who hold to Christ because we will be raised to life with him. This is the good news for those who are saved and sealed by Christ. It's the real picture that God wants us to see. And in fact, it's the one that John sees because when John uh, turns to see this multitude, he actually hears them doing something. He hears this multitude from earth joining with those in heaven in praise of God. Declaring God, thanking God for what he has done in his son, in Jesus. And so that no one misses this, we actually get an explanation of this. John has this exchange with this angel, and they're kind of agreeing like, hey, someone should tell everyone what this actually means. And the angel tells him. He uses imagery that we find throughout Scripture, including some imagery that we see earlier in the book of Revelation. And he says this, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. 
They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There's all sorts of imagery that we're going to continue to work our way through, but do you see the good news, my friends? God has intervened on our behalf. The Lamb lived and died and lives again for us. That is the good news. So rejoice in it and encourage one another in it and share it. And let's hold on to it until Christ returns in the end. Would you pray with me?